Hello and welcome to the June 2023 ENSO seminar. Um, I'm delighted to be joined for our final session of the 22-23 the, the series uh, but, uh, by uh, Dr. Ines Ippolito from, well, in a meta-stable state between uh, two different affiliations at the, um, the, the Humboldt University, the, the Center for Mind and Brain in Berlin, and also Macquarie University in um, in Sydney. So uh, very welcome for our uh, for this session, you know. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to be here, especially in the grand finale of the season. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks a million for joining us and for for sharing your work, um, of which there is a um, a great deal as of late, um, as we've noted. So um, your work is sort of delightfully interdisciplinary and sort of the the kind of the in the the, the best tradition of interdisciplinary cognitive science. Uh, so you background you completed your your doctoral studies in uh, Wollongong, is that right? And then. Uh, moved to postdoctoral work at the, the Mind and Brain Institute before heading back to Australia, as you will do in the next few weeks. So you're a lecturer in, in philosophy of AI at uh, Macquarie. And you're, um, so to, to all of our viewers, then um, Ines' work um, focuses on cognition and artificial intelligence, uh, combining theories from all of the E's in cognitive science. We're not picky about our E's, we keep them going. Um, whether we've, I don't know how many we've got at this point. It all, it started with four, but um, there's a, there's, there's quite a bit of swapping around there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and also the uh, sort of complexity science, as you'll be talking a bit about today as well. Um, so Ines is, a, is a, an ethicist of AI and also a, a co-PI at the project on uh, designing urban density, neuro-urbanism as a novel approach in global health. And that's at the, the Berlin University Alliance. Um, uh, Ines keeps very, very busy indeed. Um, she's a co-founder and vice president of the International Society for the Philosophy of the Sciences of Mind, which has its inaugural hybrid conference coming up towards the end of the year. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. In December. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and is also because, um, you know, clearly not doing enough has a podcast in the works and on the way. Um, the in, in fact, The Philosopher's Way is on the way. Um, and that'll be uh, one to, to keep an eye out for. So inesipolito.com is where you'll find links to all of this information. And um, indeed, you will be able to sort of track links to the podcast and so on for, for it to show up there in the future. So um, without further ado, I guess we might sort of move to um, looking at some of the, the work that we're we'll talking about during the seminar and also um, just as we wait for people to join us live via the stream, so we have a few viewers in, um, and we might have sort of more coming in in a few minutes. We'd like to take a little time to um, pause for a bit of uh, pause for a moment just as we start, and get straight into what we sometimes call our commercial break. Um, so we have a, a few things to celebrate and to just um, flag as as worthy of notice and uh, coming up and, and recently out on this front. Isn't it? Yes, I do. Um, I'm going to just share my screen so that I can share a few things that I'm quite excited about that have been um, coming out um, just the last uh, couple of weeks. And um, and yeah, so um, this is absolutely shameless advertising, uh, <laughs> but I think... <laughs> but I am very excited about all of these works and collaborations. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just mention them in case anybody else is also interested in these kind of topics. So there is this uh, commentary that I've written for um, as a commentary to Susan Schneider's Artificial You. And this is a special issue um, that is uh, being um, published in the Philosophy of East and West journal. And it will be coming out in the issue of April uh, 2024. But the preprint is already out there. If anybody is interested, it's the human roots of artificial intelligence. Um, so that will be one of the papers. Uh, it's a very short one, uh, but where I'm already launching some of the ideas that I'm uh, already working on uh, to expand uh, in the future. Then there's this also this very um, recent paper, as uh, three days old, I think something like that, which comes from um, sort of a consortium uh, team at uh, at Versus, uh, 
Um, and here we are tackling um, one of the most important problems of uh, contemporary um, artificial intelligence um, or even um, the global global scale um, um, artificial intelligence. Um, and here we are trying to address the problem of the is what ex is called explainable AI and how neural networks works, uh, make decisions, and how can we make these decisions a little bit more transparent, such as to avoid um, uh, and diminish uh, biases in decision making in AI. So this is um, a paper that we try to offer some, some directions in um, how we can do that by employing um, active inference. Then um, another one is also out, um, as you see, just very recently, uh, one week ago or something like that, which is a paper that I'm very um, happy with because I have the tremendous opportunity to uh, collaborate with Katie Winkel and Mirette Lee, and they are absolutely extraordinary, super talented um, researchers. Um, Katie uh, works with uh, robotics um, in Scandinavia, and uh, Mirette Lee works uh, with feminist technoscience. And I'm very privileged and, and feel very honored to have had the opportunity to work with, collaborate with them in this paper, where we intend to um, share some thoughts um, and some ideas on um, the, the, the design, development, and implementation of AI, specifically focusing on human-robot uh, interaction and looking at some cases where there are some there is some propagation and reinforcement of uh, gender norms and we give some ideas or offer some ideas as to how to subvert these gender norms as we design develop and implement human robot interaction um, situations and then uh, there's also this paper which uh, just uh, came out uh, last night uh, so I thought I was very excited about sharing it with you uh, this paper is about um, employing the free energy principle in order to understand um, the coupling between the human species and the earth and specifically to address the climate um, crisis that uh, that of course that we have and how can we understand it um, especially when it comes to the human species or from the human species point of view, relation or attitude towards the, the climate crisis and how can we better understand it. And also we offer some ideas on how to address it. And that's it. Those are the papers I was uh, happy to share with you. That's superb. Thank you very much for that. So there is... Uh, you you keep us busy just reading. Lord alone knows how you have time to get through all the writing of it. But it's <laughs> it's, a, it's a fantastic series of papers, and it's brilliant to see this kind of work um, pouring out. And the the um, you know the, the importance of it, the you know the practical efficacy and the kinds of problems that we're, um, we're you're you're dealing with in in those in those works. It's great. Yeah, I've become ever more um, more um, motivated to asking that question about uh, how, what is the societal impact of my work? As in, I don't want to publish papers and just leave them in the journals and have no societal impact in, in the gates of academia. So I've become very motivated to make those real world connections and especially coming from an activism, I think it's very much possible and it's very much doable. Um, and it's even, even makes an activism even more inactive. I fully <laughs> agree. So I guess, um, speaking of an activism, I, we're probably on time now to move to the, the presentation part of the seminar. So I will invite you, Ines, to um, give the, the June 2023 ANSO seminar. Thank you so much. Um, so I will uh, just start. Um, so the topic that I'm going to talk about today is mainly about cognitive model modeling and invite us to think about what cognitive modeling is. There are many things that I find, ex or many philosophical questions that I find extremely interesting and worth pursuing when it comes to cognitive modeling. Um, and I am going today to focus mostly 
on the technical part of it and on the scientific practice part of it. But there are other questions that I'm not going to bring up um, today uh, that, um, that I think this is a very uh, important um, philosophical topic um, that needs to be addressed and discussed. What I want to explore today is specifically to look at cognitive modeling as an analogy uh, with, um, with a language game, the language game that Wittgenstein tells us about. Um, so cognitive modeling is a situated cultural practice. So that's what I'm going to try to uh, show you, or at least um, give you some pointers on how we can think of um, cognitive model like that. And if we do that, uh, then if that will have any uh, sort of implications to the ways that we deal with, think or employ cognitive modeling within the interdisciplinarity of cognitive science to understand um, the mind and brain. Okay, so um, I will start by uh, defining what computation is, and because I've already I've already disclosed that I'm, I'm going to be gearing towards um, situated cultural practices and Wittgenstein's philosophy, um, computation is, or I want to argue that computation is something that humans do. And this comes all the way from the abacus. Uh, so when we use tools to compute or calculating using our fingers or using a calculator that we have developed, or even when developing sophisticated computers, as well as, of course, computational models where we find our uh, cognitive modeling techniques. And this is so much so that you can see this picture right here, which is the very famous picture of the woman of NASA, the woman that were called human computers. And they were the ones that calculated all of those very difficult, sophisticated mathematical um, equations that uh, helped um, the human species to go uh, into orbit. So they were the human computers. And that's the idea that I want to pursue. Um, but I'm first going to formulate the problem. So the problem um, takes the shape of uh, whether computer or computation is independent of human practices. As I said, a highly sophisticated form of computation. And it allows us, for one, to simulate or test a theory or a hypothesis, especially when we cannot set up an experimental um, setting or an experimental design to test some theory or some hypothesis. hypothesis. So then what we can do is um, design and develop a computer simulation in order to help us um, understand um, a or test a particular theory or hypothesis. The second thing that the computational modeling allows us to do is to understand and predict behavior. So once we have tested a theory and hypothesis, we can refine our models, and this can help us understand the phenomenon and also uh, hopefully as well predict a certain behavior of that particular system. So we do this across the sciences. We do this in engineering, in economics, in social sciences, in artificial intelligence and neuroscience. In all across sciences, we use computational models in order to test our theories and hypotheses, all the way from uh, testing theories about, about black holes until uh, testing theories about cells or even the brain. Um, some of the other things that we, we use is, for example, when we want to build a new bridge, we come up with a model such as to test or to understand um, how to better build the, the bridge itself. Or when we want to predict the weather, we also can develop models that allow us to precisely um, predict the weather or even social networks in social sciences. It's also another um, real world um, problem uh, or phenomenon that we want to understand. So then we develop and design uh, these models that allow us to simulate for testing or um, understand and predict behavior. So here is a different graph in order to um, sort of like put things together where they, they happen. Um, we have a natural world which is um, uh, uh, permeated by um, different uh, phenomena and in scientific practices, what we do is we define a certain phenomenon that we are interested in studying. 
And then we can develop our best, uh, most sophisticated mathematics to allow us and help us develop computational models such that we can understand or predict a certain phenomenon of our scientific interest. I want to stress that these scientific um, models occur within the space of the natural world and within the space of social cultural practices and that's where i'm going to put some emphasis um in this talk or what i want to bring out as such um in in this talk um in very very simple terms the idea is that scientific practices of developing computational models is not uh, isolated activity that is uh, encapsulated from the natural world or the social cultural practices that it is, that is encapsulated from the real world. It is within the world that we develop um, these uh, scientific models. So in a way, you cannot step outside of the natural world where the phenomenon are, where the phenomena is, in order to um, conduct the scientific practice. It takes place within that world. Um, so it is the case, as I just referred to, that across the sciences, we use computational models to understand or predict a certain phenomenon from black holes to cells. But the problem um, that I want to bring up today for us to think about is that in cognitive science, and particularly when employing cognitive modeling, a specific phenomenon happens. It's quite peculiar because uh, th this phenomenon does not happen in other sciences. And that is that the target system under investigation, say cognitive processes, say the brain, is thought to, or in many, in much of the literature, it is articulated as possessing the ontological properties of the model, of the computational model itself. And what this means is that the target system is seen as being literally computational. And this links to the question that motivates this, this work here, which is, does computation exist outside of the computational model? That's the question that I'm, I'm trying to, to, to stay with and think about. Because in cognitive science, these very peculiar phenomenon happen where we assume that the target system, in no other science we do that when we employ a computational model. All in cognitive science, we assume that the target system has the properties of the computational model. That is, the target system, such as the brain or cognitive processes, is computational. There is computation regardless of a scientific modeling taking place. So that's quite interesting. So the idea is that computers must be found independently of scientific practice in the natural living world. Because when we think about it and we stay with the problem, we can see that the implications of saying that cognition is computational then the, 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 the implication of that statement is that computers' computation must be found in the natural living world, regardless and independently of scientific practice of developing computational models. So I want to put pressure on that. I want to claim that cognitive modeling as a form of computation, as, a, as something that we do, requires human enculturated skills. So, and I want to claim that by virtue of following the following um, argument. Computation, I, um, I, I postulate computation requires human enculturated skills. Cognitive model, modeling is a form of computation. And therefore my claim is that cognitive modeling as a form of computation requires human enculturated skills. So, Bear with me um, and let's see if I'm making any sense. This, um, I'm going to just share this with you. It was just coming up on Twitter this morning. Um, there was this sharing of this tweet. And I thought it was exactly um, uh, in line with what I was going to say today. So I thought I'm just going to bring this up um, and also give credit to this person who was very much in line. Um, I just um, captured uh, his idea there where uh, he says, the only thing you're showing by comparing computation, in this case, machine learning, 
to how human think, humans think is your ignorance of both computer science and biology. And I thought this was very much in line with um, the argument that I'm trying to formulate here. So um, the idea about um, postulating computation um, in living systems, such as in cells or in neurons or in brains, um, is, of course, has been around for a long time. And, of course, all of us in Western philosophy of mind are very much acquainted with the mind-machine metaphor since Aristotle and, of course, all the way up to Helmholtz today. Um, this um, this mind-machine metaphor allowed some progress back in the day because for the first time it allowed a conceptual toolkit that um, that cognitive psychology desperately needed to push back against behaviorism because behaviorism in itself was also not um, very suitable or for progressing in understanding um, cognition and the mind. So then at the time, the conceptual toolkit that was allowed by the, the mind-machine metaphor, especially uh, arriving from um, Turing machines, allowed precisely to refer and enable the scientific practice to understand and refer to mind and cognition. So it allowed that conceptual toolkit that we didn't have before, like inputs, outputs, processes, computations. So it allowed us to refer to or to try to address the black box problem that was arising from uh, behaviorism. So then uh, within the mind machine metaphor, um, sort of like framework or, or, or way of thinking, then a few um, theories and frameworks arise. We see, for example, rule-based models where we can find, for example, the modularity of the mind or connectionist inspired theories or neural networks or mechanicism. We see arising rule-based um, uh, models or theories of the mind that are very much developed and have been uh, some have been quite useful in understanding um, neural um, neural dynamics and activity. Then we also find uh, the Bayesian models, uh, where we find, for example, predictive coding, which uh, showed up uh, mostly in 99 by uh, Rao and Ballard. And then we have predictive processing, as well as active inference. And we see that on uh, this mind machine metaphor can be taken uh, quite literally in some um, approaches within uh, these particular frameworks. We see, for example, Jakob Huy, uh, who is very clear in his self-evidencing brain that the mind is a statistical inference machine. And it's curious because in this paper, um, he even clearly states that you can throw away the body, the world, and other people. So it's quite machinery, um, the mind um, in um, prediction error minimization um, as uh, thought of by uh, Jakob Huy. But there's also more um, realist uh, or at least explicit uh, realist accounts of, for example, the Bayesian models. For example, Michael uh, Rescora, um, he defends a realist perspective on the Bayesian cognitive science. And here, um, uh, roughly, the argument in, for example, this paper is that if computational modeling um, is a good predictor, then the target system is committed to the properties outline, outlined by the cognitive modeling or the cognitive model. So it is um, the condition for, um, for the mind to have the ontological properties of the model is that the model is a good predictor. So that'll be the, uh, the condition for the mind to possess literally the, the properties of the computational model. And well, of course, uh, in this particular paper, what Michael tells us is that if Bayesian cognitive science is so successful uh, as a predictor, then it must be the case that we have a Bayesian brain. So that's more or less um, uh, where we are in this particular kind of uh, framework that is uh, motivated by the mind-machine metaphor. And then uh, we have um, some questions that come up out of um, this particular uh, framework that some people have started thinking about is the question that whether of whether computers can really be found independently of scientific practice in cognitive systems. So the idea is, is there a computer, is there really a computation that is independent of scientific practice? Or is it a metaphor? 
Because indeed, we talk about the mind-machine metaphor, and this mind-machine metaphor is really important because, as George Lakoff and uh, Mark Johnson have uh, very um, nicely put in their book, uh, metaphors are extremely important for the development and the leveraging and the motivating of scientific practices because um, they um, shape scientific progress by pointing out research directions that are worth pursuing. So that's the idea. We are not, we don't have um, the energy, the capacity or the funding to pursue in very real world um, thinking about uh, the investigation that we do in cognitive science and neuroscience. We do not have the energy or the funding to pursue all of the possible uh, ways of thinking to understand the mind and brain. So then metaphors are quite useful because they help us uh, uh, leveraging our thinking and pointing some directions that are worth pursuing. So then uh, what seems to be the case in Western philosophy of mind is that many theories have pursued the mind machine metaphor as opposed to other potential metaphors. And this is important for us to think about and in philosophy of mind to ask the question, why is that the case? Is it the case that the mind machine metaphor is the most suitable, most useful one? Is that why we are not really in the mainstream Western philosophy of mind, at least, we are not pursuing or exploring other metaphors? Is there a, a particular reason or is there a scientific evidence that, that would put us into that direction as opposed to exploring other directions? As a metaphor, um, the question then comes to, in order to, to, to assess um, the directions that we are taking, so take, take a stop, take a stock into what we are doing and where we are taking um, uh, the cognitive science, take responsibility for it and ask these questions about, as a metaphor, is this metaphor, the mind-machine metaphor, is it useful? Is it the most suitable metaphor? it's important for us to stop and think about that. One paper that has made two very good points, I think, um, is this paper by uh, Van Held, and what might cognition be if not computation? And um, in here, um, Van Held makes these uh, two uh, interesting points and I think relevant points. There are at least two reasons why the second question is important, which is the, the question of why um, the mind machine metaphor. First, arguments in favor of some broad hypotheses are rarely, if ever, completely general. They tend to be arguments not for A alone, but rather for a favor A as opposed to B. So arguments not for a particular way of thinking, such as the mind machine metaphor, but rather in favor of A as opposed to B. And this worked um, well or somewhat um, worked in back when uh, we had this uh, uh, um, distinction between or these two frameworks, the behaviorism and cognitivism uh, back in the day. So it was this very limited or binary, um, lacking nuance uh, way of thinking where it's either A or B, behaviorism or uh, cognitivism. And that's why usually the arguments for the mind-machine metaphor tend to have that flavor of um, A as opposed to B. But is that a false dichotomy? So that's, I'll just leave that open. The second reason we need to ask what alternatives there may be is that one of the most influential arguments in favor of computational views is the claim that there is simply no alternative. And precisely here, this is um, sometimes known as what else could it be argument? And this has been uh, formulated in, in, in many places, but uh, here Alan uh, Newell uh, puts it as such. Although a small chance exists that we will see a new paradigm emerge for mind, it seems unlikely to me. Basically, there do not seem to be any viable alternatives. This position is not surprising. In lots of sciences, we end up where there are no main alternatives around to the particular theories we have. Then, all the interesting kinds of scientific action occur inside the major view. 
it seems to me that we are getting rather close to that situation with respect to the computational theory of mind. So this particular second um, problem that is identified by Van Held is precisely the there simply there is no alternative. Others um, have also reinforced um, some uh, criticism about the no alternative kind of uh, problem uh, to the mind machine metaphor. And this is um, this is in in, in uh, Rodney Brooks's uh, words. This is the he says that this view is so ingrained in computational cognitive neuroscience that one would seem mad to question it. Some might say because computation makes us blind. So that's uh, Rodney Brooks. And then Francis uh, Egan tells us. Despite the fact that there is no widely accepted naturalistic foundation for representational content, computational theorists persist in employing representational language in articulating their models. Further, so not only do we have uh, these problems identified in robotics by Rodney Brooks, but also by uh, in philosophy by uh, Frankie Egan, and um, also um, in neuroscience. So um, this particular case, I, I, I find it as, a, as quite elucidating of the finding of representations or the modular or, or the, the mind machine metaphor of being particularly problematic in a very explicit way. And in this paper by Walter Freeman and Christine Scarda, representations who needs them, they tell us, and I thought it would be worth for us to read them, to read um, this passage that is in the paper. For more than 10 years, we tried to say that each spatial pattern was like a snapshot, that each burst served to represent the odorant with which we correlated it, and that the pattern was like a search image that served to symbolize the presence or absence of the odorant that the system was looking for. But such interpretations were misleading. They encouraged us to view neural activity as a function of the features and causal impact of stimuli on the organism and to look for a reflection of the environment within by correlating features of the stimuli with neural activity. This was a mistake. After years of sifting through our data, we identified the problem. It was the concept of representation. So here they too identify in their studies of utterance, they, they too identify problems with um, having the mind machine metaphor as a metaphor setting a direction to um, the, the, the investigation or research on neural activity and in this particular case was uh, of the of utterance. So then it seems that um, Maybe there are no alternatives, uh, and that can be due to many reasons. Um, but if that would be, that could very well be the case, but that is actually not the case. And I want to turn now our attention to that. Could, that could very well be the case, but it is not the case. There are alternatives, there are other metaphors. The question then for us to think about is whether these other metaphors are going to be more suitable or not to the mind-machine metaphor. But this in itself is already um, a challenge for the, there's simply, there is no alternative arguments um, to the mind-machine metaphor. Okay. So for example, um, one possible potential um, alternative metaphor, not the only one, but one possible alternative metaphor is to think about uh, living systems in the natural world as oscillators. For example, the brain or cells and oscillators are, for example, pendulums, swings, flapping of wings, string musical instruments, the beating of the heart, electronic circuits, all of those, uh, or all of those systems that generate electrical signals. All of these are um, systems or objects that we have in, and find in the natural world uh, that display some kind of oscillating behavior. 
and they are physical systems or devices that exhibit more precisely periodic or rhythmic behavior. And they produce a signal or a waveform that oscillates around a certain point or frequency, typically in a repetitive manner. And this is quite useful because then when we are to study these systems, what we are looking for is patterns of behavior. And that's where we start building our scientific models. So then... Um, there are other metaphors, but for, for, for today, I'm just going to do a comparis comparison between a computer and an oscillator, because as I did say before, um, then the question comes to, is the mind-computer metaphor the most suitable? If we have already established that there are other metaphors, then the question comes, is the mind-machine metaphor the most suitable? So then in comparison between the mind-computer metaphor, so the computer uh, mind and an oscillator, we can find at least three um, categories where we can, which we can use to adjudicate. So in terms of the kind of system, the computer is a human-made system and the oscillator is a natural physical phenomenon. In terms of complexity, the computer has somewhat limited complexity and the oscillator uh, displays complex behavior. The computer, uh, in terms of non-linearity, uses typically linear logic and binary states and the oscillator uh, has um, small changes in the initial conditions will lead to large changes over time. So in this particular regard of this is not an exhaustive list. Um, this is just a, a, a very superficial attempt to uh, just highlight uh, most significant, significant differences between a computer and uh, an oscillator. And I want to now um, turn us to look into what uh, kind of research or what kind of paradigm or uh, way of um, proceeding in scientific uh, neuroscience research of the brain looks like once we um, do not start leveraging our theory and models from a um, mind-machine metaphor point of view. So if we would were to start with the, the, the oscillator, oscillator metaphor, um, so to speak, then um, we would find uh, research such as uh, this particular um, one that has been developed and has been out um, just very, very recently in February this year. Um, and in this particular um, research, uh, what we find is, uh, I, I, I brought this because I thought really illustrates um, the point of metaphors being at the basis of the scientific practices that we engage with. So here what uh, the authors do is they establish an analogy between oscillator, oscillatory patterns and the higher dimensional analog of resonance models in musical instruments akin to uh, reverberations. And now um, quoting them, uh, they say echoes inside the brain's complex spatial patterns are a result of transient and independently oscillating underlying modes, just like individual instruments participate in creating a more complex piece in an orchestra. Clear waves of activity, like waves in the ocean, propagating in complex patterns within the cortex and the stereatum, where each standing wave was found to cover extended areas of the brain, with peaks distributed in distinct cortical and subcortical structures forming functional networks. This is a paper published um, in Nature, and what it shows is that um, the mind-machine metaphor is not the only metaphor. So we have debunked at least one argument. We have debunked the argument that there is no other way. So the mind machine is not the only metaphor. And I could um, also present other papers that have been also developed and are developed under um, the oscillatory um, analogy um, that are quite interesting. But this particular one that I showed uh, uh, is quite recent and um, it really illustrates the, the this metaphor with oscillatory uh, patterns uh, thinking. So the mind-machine metaphor is not the only metaphor, at least that much we have debunked. Now then, the other question that we had was, is it the most suited? 
it may also not be the most suited because if we think about what um, these other researchers, uh, Freedom uh, for, and, and Scarda were telling us, after years and years of looking for certain things coming from um, that would come and would be motivated by the mind machine metaphor, they finally found what was the problem and why they were on an impasse. So uh, having said all of this, at least we can come to a certain conclusion, if nothing else. Metaphors underlying cognitive modeling of scientific practice, even that often oscillator, are a human practice. Developing cognitive models is a human practice. Now comes the burden of proof to precisely show that um, metaphors, or more precisely, cognitive modeling of scientific practice are a human or is a human practice. Cognitive modeling of scientific practice is a human practice because, I want to say, it requires enculturation. What does this mean? This means that through development, uh, human beings like us uh, develop the, the conceptual and mathematical skills that allow us to, um, to, to engage in representational skill practices. And some of us even become scientists and develop and design uh, computational models that allow us to have uh, epistemic gain in um, in science in general and in cognitive science in particular. And some things to keep in mind with this notion of enculturation, as I am building here, is that although the process of enculturation is ongoing as humans develop the subjective experience that we have as we are born do not diminish as a result of the acquisition of symbolic tools of thinking, such as concepts or mathematical thinking, reasoning skills, inference skills. So the subjective experience is still there, uh, shaping as well the enculturated practices. So these embodied experiences that emerge from organisms' interactions with the environment, they remain integral to the human perception and understanding. So they, in a way, what I'm trying to say here is, and of course, I'm, I'm very much here relying on the literature of inactivism, radical inactivism and Wittgenstein. The idea here is that the embodied experience of the world is shaped and shapes our enculturated, more representational, conceptual and mathematical and computational practices, even as we develop the ability to conceptually articulate and reflect upon our situated world involving experiencing or experiences. So the point is that the parameters of adjudic adjudicating in both subjective experience and its conceptual articulation are determined by the social cultural environment that we are part of. What is uh, reasonable to think about, what is uh, reasonable to uh, feel given a certain circumstance, um, is adjudicated within a social cultural environment. We cannot step outside of that social cultural environment. That, that's the idea. So then um, building from um, this uh, way of understanding cognition as a scaffolded um, developmental skill or capacities that come from very basic forms of cognition and experience upon which we scaffold more, com more, more sophisticated and representational skills such as making inferences, thinking, believing, uh, propositional thinking. Um, so that eventually um, allow us to engage in more sophisticated scientific practices. And we are able to do that because of a particular um, because of a particular uh, property of our enculturation, which is language. And in this particular case, instead of being uh, linked to particular objects or concepts, the words and concepts and phrases that we use um, form a natural uh, form a network of language practices that are going to determine the meanings. What this means from a Wittgensteinian point of view is that the meanings of the words or phrases uh, of or our thinking are dependent on the use that we give to it in a particular social cultural practice. So language 
uh, becomes quite relevant in holding this social cultural setting together. Language is not a fixed system of rules or definitions. Language is not mind independent or transcendental representation, but rather it is a dynamic and constantly evolving practice as its use is different um, in different contexts, is going to shape its development. So that's quite interesting and relevant. Therefore, language can only be comprehended in relation to and within the practices and activity of the community that employs it and not in isolation. And the same goes as we scale things up to scientific practice. So the same way in which language uh, can be thought of as depending on the use of it in a social cultural setting in scientific practice, language um, also plays that kind of very dynamic and constantly evolving um, practice that we use um, in scientific um, endeavor. And um, even in mathematics, one would say, well, but it's language. Language might be might have this more social cultural dimension. Mathematics is really what is holding and leveraging a computational modeling. So how can it be that it is this dynamic constantly evolving and not um, some kind of fixed system of rules and definitions as one sometimes may think of mathematics? Even mathematics can be thought of as this language game. Um, as uh, Wittgenstein tells us in Remarks of Philosophy of Mathematics, the real essence of mathematics lies in the practices, not in the formal systems used to describe them. And here I'm just going to uh, gesture to anyone that is interested in, or, uh, in Wittgenstein um, about his uh, rule following uh, problem. That's what he's referring to here. All right, so then um, what I want to um, say, and this was uh, what I set up as my uh, as my task um, for this um, for this talk was to um, say something about um, cognitive modeling as a language game, right, as a cultural practice of a language game. And I want to sort of instantiate that from now on and show you why that might be the case and why I think that I have reasons to think that that's reasonable. So let's look at cognitive modeling of scientific practice as a human practice. So we have, um, we can think about it as a, a, a rule, as, as a, a language game that follows rules, where you define the research question you want to answer, you choose the level of abstraction of your model, you select the appropriate, appropriate modeling framework, you implement the model using appropriate software tools, and then you validate your model and refine the model eventually. But this is all very, very dynamic, and you select the programming languages. So what happens is that we can then see uh, cognitive modeling as a language game. Why? Well, I'm going to give you a set of reasons, see if you agree with me. The use of language in cognitive modeling, uh, for example, mathematics and computer programming languages within a particular context is used, the language is implemented for epistemic gain. And there are a different set of languages that one can choose from, from Python, etc., and that are used depending on the particular context that one wants of, of the task that one, one wants to do um, in, in science. One language might be more suitable than another or might in terms of epistemic gain. Meaning, the meaning of um, the use of language is determined by the context in which it is used. I need to understand this coding system in order to uh, be able to not only design and develop a model, but to also for the negotiations and conversations between scientists. And also cognitive modeling is constantly evolving as new models are developed and new techniques are invented. Finally, the evolution is driven by the needs and interests of the community of scientists. And in this particular last one is where I think is um, uh, uh, evidence or reason to think about cognitive modeling as being culturally situated. So then um, this brings me to come back to say that computation is something that humans do from calculating, developing sophisticated computers and computational models. Then you have many different uh, language games in cognitive modeling to choose from. You have those that are leveraged by the mind-machine metaphor, such as the rule-based models that I alluded to before, like classic and connectionist or neural networks models. And then you follow a set of rules that uh, I'm not going to um, go over them because in the interest of time, 
You also have the Bayesian models or the predictive coding inspired models in which you also follow a set of rules. And, um, and this is very much idiosyncratic to the particular language game that you are playing. And finally, you have uh, the kind of research that I showed you that is leveraged by the oscillator metaphor, which leads to a different kind of language game, which is the language game that one would say that is played under complex system theory models which is slightly different because it does not um, leverage from the view of the mind-machine metaphor, but of the oscillator uh, metaphor. Conclusions. Is, I started off with this question and now I, want, I would like to answer it. Um, is a computer independent of human practices? I want to say no. And the argument that I brought forth here, or I attempted here, was um, that uh, computation requires human enculturated skills and that cognitive modeling is a form of computation and this i think gives us good reason to think that cognitive modeling as a form of computation requires human enculturated skills thank you so much thank you thank you very much Inish. um so that's excellent and um lots there too. So I'll keep an eye on the, the chat just to see if there's, a, if there's any queries coming through there. But we have a, a few minutes for a little bit of discussion. And I guess one of the first things, so I'm, I'm principally persuaded and, and essentially already on board um, with regards to the, the overall thesis. But I guess thinking of it from a someone coming from a different perspective, um, particularly someone who has grown up. I mean, in, in essence, I still have all of those intuitions and habits myself. It's like, well, um, if we want to say, well, the brain isn't necessarily a computer, how would we say that? How would you convince people that it isn't a computer? Um, and just the idea that that's something that would have to be done, that that's a way of framing the question is a kind of inherent part of the, the language game in which we find ourselves, I guess, right? The culture of cognitive science. Um, but to give you something that's just a, a little bit more um, specific then, so at the end, you're, you're essentially um, arguing in favor of a plurality of metaphors. And is it sort of a, a matter of, so um, are you committed to a pluralism? And then in terms of deciding as to which metaphor we might use from, from situation to situation, that that's essentially a, a pragmatic manner? Uh, or is there a a more principled, different kinds of principled um, way in which to evaluate or choose between these metaphors? Um, yeah, that's, that's rather a very good question. So as to address the first uh, comment that you made, I'm putting pressure on the mind-machine metaphor by coming from um, the usual reasons that one is given to think that that's the best way, the most suited way to think about or to start our endeavor of investigating um, the mind and the brain. So I'm putting pressure on why this one? So I'm staying with that question. Why this one? I need reasons. And, and if we debunk the, the best reasons out in the market, in the philosophical market, to think about the mind as a machine, then what? Then we need to look around and see, okay, so what is out there? Is there any, uh, then we need to do a task of evaluating or assessing what we have out there. So I'm not necessarily pluralist about all the metaphors. I am convinced that we need some good metaphor um, and we need to find um, at least some good reasons that lead us to use that metaphor as opposed to a different one. Right. Um, but I'm not entirely defending that the oscillator is better, but intuitively, um, on a very surface level, by the virtue of it being something that we can find already in the natural world, it may be more suited as an analogy to the rhythms and patterns of the system that is also in the natural world. That is the brain. So that's the kind of like um, um, a perspective. As to pluralism, I am pluralist in terms of techniques. So I, I brought up these only these these different three, which is already already um, uh, allows for us to talk about many uh, the rule based models or the Bayesian models or the complex systems models. These are very different. 
And of course, they've been uh, very useful in many ways. So we've learned uh, in the past 20 years, we have learned a great deal about neural, um, neural activity by virtue of using these models. But what I'm trying to question here is um, whether or not we could learn more if we were not stuck into thinking or looking for those things that we would think or expect to find in the brain if the mind-machine metaphor were the case. Maybe if we were not stuck in that metaphor, if that metaphor is the case of being a bad metaphor, then it may be the case that if we release ourselves from it, which is really hard, because like I just said, um, doing cognitive science and, and uh, neuroscience is a cultural practice. And it is extremely hard, even when one already sees reasons not to think of the mind as a machine, it is really hard because we are used to this uh, language game that has these conceptual toolkits that come already with it being the mainstream way of thinking about the mind and brain in cognitive psychology. So it's really just raising the alert and being like, is this the best way? Do the arguments for the mind-machine metaphor really stand? I don't think they stand. What do we do now? And then I do think that the plurality of techniques is very, very much accept acceptable in the sense that what dictates the technique that we are going to use is the problem that we have at hand. Right. I, I do want to know about the structure, the structure or the topology of brain of the brain. Right. And in which case, a certain technique might be much more useful where we do not have to focus on dynamics or patterns of, of activity, for example, as much. But if I want to focus on patterns of activity, I might need a different kind of toolkit. Mm. But this, of course, in, in, in requires and necessitates that we collaborate in terms of bringing these different frameworks, techniques. And for that, I think it is important to bring things down to, okay, these different computational modeling and cognitive modeling, they are language games that we can implement for epistemic gain. And potentially if we bring um, ourselves together, if all of us bring our little toolkits, maybe we will, be, um, we will make more progress. So I, uh, what I'm, I guess what I'm curious, so I, I, I... I like the point, and I always find um, interesting and useful um, analogies here with Gibson's point about perception in general, that in order to see something stationary, you need to be able to move, you know, parallax and um, and, and the movement and the dynamism of the observer is essential to effective perception. And it, there's a, a sense in which you're making a, an analogous argument for, um, for scientific um, measurement and observation, right? So we need uh, multiple perspectives from which we can observe and make measurements if we are to effectively perceive and, and be able to better uh, get a better grip on the, the phenomena in question. I guess sort of putting on a, a, a realist hat that I don't really own, but nevertheless, um, we might wear for a moment, is to think that there's a, a sort of a concerning constructivism to the philosophy of science implicit in what you say um, and the realist comeback to that, I guess, would go something along the lines of um, scientific practice is, in fact, a process of disciplining human activity. Hello. Hi, sorry about that. I'm not quite sure what happened there. We just had a, a, a delightful um, internet glitch. <laughs> That's um, okay. A bit like the weather sometimes, isn't it? You, um, you sort of, I wish you good connectivity today. Um, <laughs> to start, at what point did I disappear? 
Uh, well, um, you were um, talking about that you were going to put on your um, your uh, realist hat because it seems that there is some constructivism that is embedded here in the at least in the framework that I'm defending. Um, so yeah. I guess if if there's a uh, you know, if we say, so a realist might say, well, look, there's lots of lots of constructivism or encultured skills involved in science. Absolutely fine. We can give you that much. But what those skills do is put us in well calibrated contact with a world that just is the way the world is. And what we find is, for example, if you know, it, it's one of the some of the stronger claims of any of the computationalist camps, um, whichever version of them, they just say we just find this just is what cognition is. Um, it's not a metaphor, I guess, is the claim that it's it's something more than a metaphor. It's something that we have found to be the case. Absolutely. Is there a way that we can kind of bring these sort of two points of view into effective engagement with one another? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th there's there's part of the part of the, the conversation that I've I've not brought up because in the interest of time. But I did want to say um, that it starts off as being a metaphor and another problem that there is to metaphors or at least that we have seen in this particular one is that at some point it metamorphoses into it being the case it being a scientific fact and that's exactly what frankie egan is referring to in the passage that i've read is that it is not a scientific fact there is no scientific evidence so Maybe there is good reason to go back and call it a metaphor as a pre-scientific level of thinking to find a certain direction where we should allocate our energy and time um, in, in developing our models. So definitely it metamorphoses. And that's what then um, Freeman and Skarda have come to show, look, you made us go look for this everywhere for 10 years. We've been looking for this and it's not there and not even it's not there. It is um, it is harming and it's a way, waste, a little bit of a waste of our time in the sense that that was harming our thinking, our interpretation of the data. As soon as we've released ourselves from that, we were able to make progress. So the problem with the metaphor for us to assess whether or not this metaphor has a place or should have a place in cognitive science is about, okay, we may have made some progress, but is the pro this progress that we have made sufficient or to, to uh, sufficient for us to accept um, that this should be the way to go or the direction that one should take if there is evidence that it might be holding us back, that we could do much more progress by pursuing other metaphors, for example, of course, always with in the back of our minds that it is a metaphor, right? So in that sense, I want to address that part of the metaphor that is that can be a, a harmful is once the metaphor stops uh, being a metaphor to becoming uh, to become a scientific fact without scientific evidence. So that's harmful. And then the other part of, I think, of what you, you, you commented, you were absolutely right. And I think it needs to be addressed with this really constructivism. So um, I don't think there's a necessity to go radical constructivist on the framework or way of thinking of scientific practice. I don't think there's a necessity of doing a little bit of a, a maturana in cognitive science. That's uh, probably a bit much, I think. Um, it makes sense to um, think that there is, like, like I had the little graph in one of the slides, there is a very good reason to think that there is a natural world in itself that exists and that we have a certain perspective, we have a stance, we have a standpoint. Now here to use a, a term from feminist epistemology, we have a standpoint from which we investigate the world. And this is our best possibility. So that is, it is in that sense that we are epistemic communities in science, that within these epistemic communities, we together build this knowledge, which is a conjunction of the, the various perspectives and standpoints that people, different people, different epistemic communities have. And then different epistemic communities negotiate with other epistemic communities. They, they, they communicate their models of a certain object, and in this case, uh, the brain or cognitive processes to each other. And we reason with each other about 
um, what might be the case. But it's a little bit of what might be the case because we have this limited perspective. We, it's not possible. One would one could 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 aim and could claim the scientism um, claim that it is possible to have this objective perspective to build science and that science is a discovery. So that's really hardcore realism, that science is this discovery of what is out there in, in the world, right? One could claim that, that's the, the, the hardcore uh, realism. I think there is a much better reason to, to believe in, in, in science as the continuation of our social cultural practices. Because if we look at the, or characterize or look at the phenomenon of scientific practices and activity, it is not encapsulated from the world. It is highly situated on the world that we inhabit, on our on our own um, niche, our local environment, our local social cultural values and beliefs and goals. So I think there's a much better reason to 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 take a stance on. Okay, the 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 scientific practice is taking a stance from the perspective that I am uh, integrated and situated at. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, I, I can't be persuaded. Uh, so, um, so we are at this point. I think we're probably running a little over time, and I, I, I appreciate very much all the time that you've given us and um, your willingness to share your work. And my um, pleasure. It's um, it's been a, a great way to finish off the series for this year. And so, uh, Inisha Ipolito, I wish you um, all the best for the summer, and thanks very much for. For joining us and for sharing your work today yeah you too and thank you so much for having me what a pleasure thank you thanks very much so hopefully we will pick, kick things back off then um in september with uh, another series of of enzo samurai perfect um,